we need to look more, much, much more closely at the experience of the leader at mm. all levels of the organization, whether they are at the kind of board level or all the way down to the person who's running kind of that frontline team. Um, because they are hugely important connective tissue in our organization. Never in the field of human conflict. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? You're listening to the Big Quest podcast with Andy Murray. In a high stakes, unpredictable world, every day is ripe with blue ocean adventures just waiting to be discovered. You need the mindset, the methods, and the motivation to lead with confidence into the unknown. Come along as we talk to today's top leaders, known for simplifying challenges, outsmarting variables, and inspiring greatness. It's the Big Quest Podcast. Here's Andy Murray. Hey, Ben. How are you doing today? Andy, always good to see you. Uh, today, we're talking to Adrian Swinsko. He is a thought leader, consultant, a writer, a podcast producer. He's a lot of things. His brand is Punk CX. And he is a leading thinker on customer experience, and the aesthetics of his latest book really show that. Yeah, he's a really cool guy, and I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, I discovered Adrian f through some research I was doing on top thinkers in the customer experience space and started to listen to his podcast called Punk CX, which I highly recommend, by the way. And, you know, customer experience work is still pretty much in an early state, and it's a space full of uncertainty and complexity. And Adrian is right in the front lines of it. And there's a lot we can learn from this veteran who's been slaying dragons. And so I'm really excited for us to go listen to this podcast. All right, let's jump in. Well, hello, Adrian. How are you today? I'm awesome, Andy. How are you getting on? I am doing well. I, I'm going to immediately uh, apologize for the disappointment that we're not here to play or talk about tennis. And... Uh, <laughs> Given uh, everywhere I went in Britain, it was I was a slight disappointment when they said they were talking or meeting with Andy Murray. So I I, I know you know that already, but and I'm sure it's the accent that gives it away, right? Well, you know, you don't you don't sound like you're from Dunblane. So I mean, being a kind of an expatriate Scot who's living in kind of Brighton on the south coast of England, I can generally pick out kind of a Scottish accent from time to time, and so. If maybe kind of like Andy loses his kind of accent when he's out on the tour and he could just like hams out when he's back home, who knows? I mean, who knows? Well, if you've not lived in the UK uh, it's for four years there, I was just surprised at how many dialects and, you know, 22 different at least uh, dialects, probably more than that, and accents that uh, what you find in America is they think everybody in the UK sounds like the people on the BBC. <laughs> and you really don't even have a clue. I mean, it's not a clue unless you've lived there. Yeah, no, it's like uh, accents. I think that's one of the things that the UK does is that we have this, I guess the density of accents are, it's quite phenomenal, actually. Yeah, it is. And it was quite a learning experience for me. But anyway, and then the phrases that go with that. Uh, yeah. So now then, uh, you know, how are you doing? That's a very Yorkshire thing to say. And, and I said, now, now then what? Uh, and, uh, or it was, uh, the, yeah, it starts with I up, I up. A -up. That's like, how a are you doing? Right. I up. Yeah. A up is good. I used to, I spent quite a bit of time in Yorkshire when I was growing up. And so yeah. A up is a, is a thing. And then, um, the response one, back of now then, right. It's, isn't that the response now then? Well, um, you could actually kind of argue that kind of a up and, and, and now then are one of this one of the, one of the same things. You can go a up, or you can go now then, and it's like one of the same things. Well, yeah, it's obvious they're the same thing to me. Obvious. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while, and the only other thing I would say that took me a while. I thought the Yorkshire pudding was a dessert because in the U.S. pudding is a dessert, and, well, and it's not. You know, it's not let's not get into the cookie and the biscuit thing. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, Unless exactly. Let's not talk about grit either, because, I mean, crumbs. <laughs> well, you know, we could talk about a lot of things, but one of the things that we definitely have in common is this passion for customer experience. And uh, and what I'm really interested in talking to you about today, in addition to hearing a bit more about what you're doing with the book, is uh, Punk CX, which is a great mm. read, by the way. Um, Thank you. Is 
is to talk a little bit about the spaces you go into that are new. And uh, that's an area that I've been working a lot in of how do you help passionate leaders create breakthrough change in some of the new spaces that hasn't been done before. So the more blue ocean work and mm -hmm. as you point out in your book about 72% of customer experience initiatives fail or they fail to deliver what was promised. So uh, doing something new is very different than removing dissatisfiers. Mm -hmm. And that's a great space to work in customer experience too. But when I start thinking about who's doing new things, I immediately go to the customer experience industry or sector or practice area, and you're a leader in that space. So I just love to hear your thoughts on how getting to new is so challenging, and yet how are some, some ways you've found a way to solve it? So I think the thing is about, um, so I think there's, there's, there's an interesting kind of thing. I mean, you talk about kind of like um, moving away from the dissatisfiers and thinking about the new new sort of thing. But I think there's opportunity in the dissatisfiers oh, as yeah. well. I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day on a thing, and I said, would it be wonderful if you had somebody celebrate your complaints procedure? Hmm. Yeah. Right? Just as a, a, just a yeah. different way of looking at things. And somebody kind of like, you know, we're human beings, right? And we know that yeah. stuff kind of goes wrong. And then somebody kind of and somebody went something went badly wrong, and somebody makes a, an official kind of complaint, and then they, they they enter your complaints procedure. But the way that you handle it and manage it and everything is just like off the chart. Yeah, you know that idea is like going the complaints department, the complaints procedure, those facilities are they're just kind of like forgotten about. So I think there's an opportunity in all sorts of things. I mean, the way I think about it is that. I think that we we end up thinking about mis, uh, experiences and they're a bit like a bell curve, right? And the things where people talk about things tend to happen on the edges, but we generally don't stress test or really learn about what's happening on the edges. Mm. So you think about the things where people that, where they, things go really, really well or this moment of memory or delight or something. I don't know if we really, really sort of forensically investigate what happened and why and what we can learn from that where we can go from that and equally on the on the other end on the other end where people are um, completely thrown by the, what's happened and then they become confused and irate and, and angry and sort of things and how we manage kind of that and manage the the anger and the emotion in that um, such that it can create an opportunity for massive recovery there's this fascinating um, idea called the service recovery paradox where it says that if you recover well when something goes wrong then uh, then you can create a higher perception of or a higher degree of satisfaction than if nothing kind of went wrong now that's not a good strategy obviously I have to point out it's a <laughs> here, right. that we need to create kind of potholes in the road to kind of give us a chance to recover but there is opportunity when things are going to go wrong. And I think when you think about this blue ocean type of idea yeah. is we, I think the thing that drives a lot of that is curiosity and questioning the assumptions around what, how we do things and how we go about things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a great way to look at it. And I think too often sometimes we're using customer data to isolate problems. You could see in customer data or NPS, the dissatisfiers, and we tend to, dismiss some of that versus what do you really learn from it to find the new spaces. And so you're absolutely right. And there's cert I've never seen a spreadsheet give up an epiphany on a customer insight. Uh, have you? Uh, uh, no. Um, I think the epiphanies come from stories yeah. that you hear because it's all about that connection, right? It's like we have this fascination with solutions and technologies and processes and systems. But we forget this. The fundamental fact is that it is people that are building these things, and it is people that are buying these things. So there are people at the beginning and the end of everything, mm. and we 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 forget that actually how we feel about stuff and it is the thing that generates stories and the things that generate kind of memories and feelings and things, and that's the thing that we need to lean into. You know, both the good stuff and also the bad stuff. Now I really. I'm not, not, I don't have a morbid fascination kind of with it, but I have a 
fascination with the stuff that elicits, you know, um, what we would con constitute negative emotions, be only because of the psychological kind of like impact of it. You know, studies have shown that we remember things that, that are associated with risk and disappointment and failure or uncertainty between five and 17 times more than we do things associated mm. with joy and surprise and delight. And you, and you look at that and go, well, there's the ROI of all this sort of stuff, right? And, and, but the interesting thing about it is that the reason why this works and this, why this happens is because we tend to, as human beings, ruminate on those stuff. Right. It becomes a survival instinct right in the back of our, you know, our amygdala sort of thing is we are, we are hardwired to avoid these things. And yet I don't think that as organizations spend enough time um, meditating on that type of stuff and actually doing kind of like the real work that, that means that they, they, they can be 100% effective 100% of the time. Yeah, you don't really see on the board level a psychologist or a neuroscience specialist uh, yet, I would think, given how things really work, even inside an organization and the people dynamics of that, uh, they would be companies would be served well by thinking about the neuroscience and the human condition. I, you know, one of the things that was said to me a while back that I, now, I've never forgotten it, it says, you know, the word customer itself is a problem in terms of it's a transactional description versus just calling it people. And you started by saying it's people on both ends. And I started to change my framework when I started looking at it as people, not customers. Does that make any sense? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think that the, the, the um, it, 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 uh, oh, crumbs. it annoys me <laughs> like, really <laughs> a lot when you have kind of companies that are, they're in this kind of like you know, space where they go, oh, the customer's really important and people are at the heart of everything that we do and, uh, yeah. you know, we, we're customer-centric and everything else. And then they talk about um, wallet share. Mm. And I look at it and just go, language is important because language frames how we think about things. So I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. It's like the idea about um, talking about not customers, but actually kind of people is, is kind of fine. But we also have to drill deeper into that, think about the mechanics of it, because we can get, we can go down one level. And when we still, when we have people that are still talking about kind of wallet share, then that feel, makes it sort of commodifies the whole kind of human being in many ways. So you're not actually interested in the person, you're only interested in how much money they've got in their pocket. Yeah, well, I've been through a lot of revolutions and, evolutions in the retail space since it's been most of my career and you can see that play out uh, in so many ways when and you I'm sure know this but there were days when time a time when uh, retailers would put the things that people need most in the back of the store to yeah. make them spend time in that store even though they didn't want to spend time in that store <laughs> under the notion that they would spend more and, and they might and they, and they probably do, but they're not going to want to come back. And I think we start thinking about people as people and what do they want? You know, there's a time budget, a money budget and a frustration budget. And if you're just thinking about price um, and you want to keep them in the store longer, then someone's going to come along and give them a better experience where they can get in and out very quickly. And it's, uh, it's, yeah, it, that, that, I think we've moved on from that somewhat. You see most retailers now putting the grab and go type items in the front, which is a huge step forward in at least starting to think about people as having needs around time and humanity. I, I think that's kind of fair. There's a, there's a great, um, well, there's a, I, I collect quotes from people that I see around the place, which I think kind of describe the situation. And there was a great one from, um, I think it was Alan Alda, the actor, <laughs> who was giving a speech at his daughter's college. I think it was at the commencement address or something. And he said, the quote was something like, um, our windows on the world, uh, our assumptions are our windows on the world. We should clean them off every once in a while so we can see clearly. Hmm. Great quote. And I think that's the thing that is is really I find that really really interesting because we make assumptions about what's 
what works and what doesn't work, and what's important and what's not important, and what's easy and what's not easy. And if we don't examine those sort of things, then they just become, they're just assumptions. And we want, right. and, you know, and, and, and I think that's where, you know, going back to your point around kind of what's the new, new type of thing is only when we, when we are open to examining all the assumptions that we make and being honest about those, then can we really see clearly? And when we can see clearly, then we can actually start to explore well, what matters. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great thought. And something you said in there that resonates with me, we are definitely getting more and more complex. And mm -hmm. the world's more complex. It's, you know, the VUCA thing is alive and well. We're probably in a super VUCA world by now. Yeah. But, but there is, uh, with every force, it's like the Nic Nicholas Negropont, I think, the balancing forces. The higher the demand for technology and need for technology, the higher the correlation, correlation to human touch is, is requested and required. And so with this increasing complexity, there is this counterbalance of simplicity. And I think things are can be a lot more simple than they are without being simplistic or or trying to simplify complexity and then in the wrong ways. But you talk a lot about simplicity in your book and and keeping things simple and looking through that. Tell me tell me more about how you look at simplicity. Well, I think it's another one of those things where people talk about the um, wanting to make things kind of simple, but um, I sometimes think that people don't necessarily try hard enough. If you give everybody a report card, you know those ones you used to get at school, it says, comes back and goes like, must try harder. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's completely that. It's like, must try harder. It's like it's a bit like where people are, are, are turning around. We, we talk about um, the conversation around, we need to be omni-channel. And you're like going, okay, what does that mean? Well, a lot of people kind yeah. of like assume or fall into this idea that omnichannel means almost every channel. And you end up with this pro proliferation and plethora of channels where you, you're trying to manage interactions with your, with your customers. And when I see that or hear about that, I challenge kind of people with this, this idea. I said like, well, if you're going to add one channel to your mix, if you're not taking away at least one, if not more other channels, then you're just adding complexity to your business. Now that's a simplistic way of looking at it, but it's a challenge nevertheless to make them think more clearly because actually the true meaning of om omni-channel, whether it's just one channel or, or, or two or way, way more, is that they should all be connected. And right. so whenever you're dealing with a, uh, with a customer, you can see all the kind of history of all the interactions kind of across different kind of channels. But that's not necessarily kind of how it's how it's understood, I think. And so, but I, I think the, the other thing about the simplicity, there's some there's some brilliant work that gets done by an agency called Siegel and Gale that's headquartered out of New York. And they have this thing that they've been running now for the last like, 10 or 15 years called the Simplicity Index, which is, if you want to look it up, it's simplicityindex.com. Mm -hmm. And they do a, uh, they do a bunch of research, which and it's global research that 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 shows the where customers believe that they deliver a simple, or uh, they have mm -hmm. simplicity at their heart. They experience the simplicity at their heart, and they track them the, the against their their portfolio a portfolio of other stocks like against the S P five hundred or or whatever, and these organizations like outperform the stock market by a factor of about like 300 in excess of something yeah. like 300%. And wow. I, I think the thing that's, that's fascinating about, about them is that they are, um, re, they are relentless in the pursuit of making things easier and more convenient and more effective, um, for their, for their customers. Um, well, that and, takes a lot of, oh, well, it takes a lot of, um, effort but you know i i'm not going to name any names but i do know of companies that absolutely are okay with a bit of friction especially if it's a returns process uh, well yeah right? i mean i mean i think there's again there's another kind of thing that's in kind of the, the experience sort of space everybody's talking about friction free experience mm -hmm. but to your to your kind of point i mean 
I mean, who's not that? So the opposite point is some people believe that everything should be friction free, but actually that shouldn't because there's such a thing as good and or bad friction. Right. And it's it's figuring out when's when's the right time to do that. I remember talking to um, Andy McMillan of testing, and he told me a story about one of his clients where the board had got it into their head around we must have a friction free experience. So they went through this process. It's an online client. They just went. Fine, we're going to make it like straight through processing. Boff, here we go. And so they improved the speed of uh, checkout, as it were. But what actually happened is it completely totaled their um, the their re repeat custom yeah. of like uh, numbers. And they were horrified by this. Well, then he just kind of went and launched into this investigation about what was going on. And what, when they looked at it really closely, is they realized that the, the, the steps the customer went through to customize their order, which was seen as being friction, bad friction, was the thing that created value for them. Hmm. And actually, that was destroying, by removing all that, was destroying their kind of business model. So they ended up right. doing all this stuff and then having to unpick it all. To go um, to, to to almost like to stabilize their kind of their business. Sure. So, I think there's a lot of memes that go around the the experience, sort of things, and people are there's there's many people that want to they say they want to lead, but actually they're just following. Hmm. They're following what they think they should do rather than actually getting on. What are we doing and why? And why does right. it matter? Why does it matter to us? And why does it matter to our customers? Well, and, and it's who who are they looking to for those inspirational points? I mean, uh, from my experience, at least in the UK, there's quite a uh, centralized collection of grocery retailers that look a lot alike mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what they offer to customers. It's very hard to differentiate. And sometimes I think the reason for that is too much focus on what the competitor's doing mm -hmm. and copying that. That's your source of new then getting outside of your domain and looking for who's best in class in a completely different area. Uh, when you're doing customer experience work, how often does that come up where you are encouraging people to go outside their domain to look for inspiration of new experiences versus just looking at competitors? I mean, all of the time. I mean, I have a slightly glib and flippant kind of way of saying people going, we need to benchmark or do best practice. I'm like, and that's a fast track to average. Right. Right, it's a bit like going. What are you yeah. kidding me? <laughs> That's great. It's like going, you know, we know, and this is the difference. The thing we kind of like the difference between what we know and what we actually get. Right, is we know that we are in our in of ourselves as human beings and as customers and 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 people who work. That, but as customers, we measure, you know all the experiences that we had and all the levels of service that we had by the best, regardless of where they are, we, we measure everything against the best. And, and if you're not, if you don't bring that to work with you and infuse that into your thinking at work, then it's like, then you're going to be average. You're going to be in the pack and right. you should stop saying we want to lead our field. You just say, we're like, we're happy in the middle of the peloton. Thanks very right. much. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, it's safe there, right? Because you know anybody in front of you is going to stumble, then you'll be right there. So yeah. it's it's the fast follower because they're probably paying a lot of money to be on that bleeding edge. And, you know, they might fail. You could pick up what they've learned. So there's a lot of logic on staying in the middle. Mm. But unfortunately, it's not really going to create the breakthrough results. Not really. No, not at all. I, I think there's the... Um, we talk about this idea of being... Um, you know, people being agile and, and, and failing fast and testing and learning and all of that sort of stuff. And that's, that's great. And, and um, it goes back to this idea of um, almost like back to kind of a Peter Senge idea of the learning organization. That's ultimately what, what kind of mm. being an agile organization is trying to enable. But I think if you want to do something which is breakthrough, then it requires a degree of bravery to try kind of like kind of things in, you know, mm -hmm. and incubate kind of like things. And that is, is that requires you to do something kind of different and be right. different and be willing to fail. Now, I'll tell you, it's a great example at this and they're doing it in public 
is and it's a, a, a you know and they're a beast and it's Amazon. Yeah. And he, who remembers the kind of the, the um the the video what was it the Amazon Fire video customer service kind of button thing where you kind of you had it and there was this new thing that they kind of advertised you so you press the button you can speak to somebody and get some service or like that was a big da da trumpeted yep. little thing where is it now yeah exactly and they kind of the great thing about kind of um, about Amazon is they are not afraid to try these things but then when they don't work they kill them and they kill them fast yeah and yeah. and and I think that that's maybe a better challenge is tell me the last time that um, you killed something. Yeah. What you're getting to is a bit more outside of the method. I mean, Agile is a great methodology, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a great methodology, but it's a tool. And if you don't have the right mindset in the organization, uh, it does take a leadership mindset to drive change, whether that's bravery or uh, as the word I used with you the other day, audacity. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to be able to um, have some other elements to it. Otherwise, another tool like uh, Deming's, you know, quality, a uh, total quality man. And mm -hmm. I think that's the risk that we have is that it's not the answer by itself because it doesn't create the bravery to put something into an agile process that will actually create an output that's going to create real change. Yeah, and I think the thing is that what I find is that we, the, um, a lot of that insight, a lot of that inspiration comes from how you are connected to both your people and your customers. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes back around to the, this idea of um, time, as it were, and how you've managed your time. I think you, go, you mentioned Deming and, and in Deming's work, there's a nice idea, you know, and it actually features in Lean as well, where it's where everything, you know, Lean comes from Deming systems thinking yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But the idea that's central to that, particularly in Lean, is this idea of the Gemba, the uh, Japanese word, the Gemba. And the, the, the Gemba talks about is this word that says, the, it means the real place. So mm. news reporters will talk about reporting from the Gemba, or police detectives will talk about the scene of the Gemba. But in commerce terms, the Gemba could be anywhere. That is the place where the real value is created, and almost okay. having to go there and, um, and and actually see how things kind of happen and how they work. Hmm. You're a retailer. I think kind of the the person that really really had this down um, really well was was Terry Lee when he was yeah. heading up Tesco's. Tesco. Yeah, he, when he repeatedly would spend 40% of his time, like two days a week in stores, either working in stores or kind of just talking to customers, just wandering around and, you know, watching people, talking to people, helping stack shelves, do all these different sort of things. And many of the things around his time as CEO, I think can be attributed back to some of the stuff that he learned and he heard about when he was on the floor speaking to people, whether they were employees or customers. And I think that it drove his level of connection. And the thing is, rather than actually just waiting for the inspiration, you almost have to go and be inspired. Yeah. You don't have to find it. It will find you if you make time to go out and see it. I've never met a retail leader that uh, was great at being a retail leader that also <laughs> wasn't like Terry out in stores with customers on a regular basis. I mean, mm. and I've worked for some great CEO retail leaders uh, between Walmart and, and Asta over the years, and the best would absolutely, you wanna have a meeting? Yeah, let's go one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, let's do it in the store while we're walking, yeah. right? And it's just the habits of being really close, or let's go spend a couple hours on the phones with, at a call center listening in. You want, you want the real unvarnished truth. Oh go to that it is shocking it will wake you up back into reality pretty quick but that's where brilliance lies yeah there amongst the weeds in the lives of the people that do the work or that are your customers that are paying you know paying the money yeah. and i think that's the the in this 
age of everything is kind of fast, 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 and people talk about back-to-back -back meetings and everything else. I, when I hear that, I think, I, I think about it, I'm like, it's horrifying. You know, like, I'm like going, oh my God, when do you actually do any work for crying out loud? <laughs> The Big Quest Podcast with Andy Murray will return right after this break. Today, more than ever, we need leaders who lead with the values of excellence, professionalism, innovation, and collegiality, which stand for EPIC. These are the values the Walton College of Business consistently demonstrate. I've worked with the Walton College as a business owner or executive for over 25 years, and I can tell you with certainty, the students we've hired, the exec ed programs, and the insights from their research have made an epic impact and continue to inspire me with new ways of thinking. Their vision to bring thought leadership to the challenges business face today, such as business integrity, or how to be a customer-centric organization, that adds real value by creating conversations that connect people with organizations, faculty, industry, and practice. I put a link in the show notes to Dean Matt Waller's Be Epic podcast, where you'll hear stories and get great content that will inspire you to be epic. We now return to the Big Quest podcast with Andy Murray. Well, you, you know, you, you bring up another good point. That I'd like to get your point of view on. I think that fast, fast, fast and scaling opt, uh, optimization type stuff is very left brain and it rewards left brain leaders tremendously that are good at that. But I think as a result of that, the right brain thinking has been uh, a bit atrophied mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how it should really work. And the things you're talking about is about paying attention. That's a very right brain exercise to pay attention to what's really going on and into the moment and seeing that. Um, uh, and I'm hopeful that more right brain thinking will be valued because if you're a curious, creative, right brain thinker in most corporations, as I've said before, you kind of get sent off to the island of misfit toys uh, and don't really get in the queue for promotion because uh, really good leaders, man, they, they want to do things that are proven, that this proven track record, pull from the uh, uh, reservoir of what's already worked before, do that again, rinse and repeat, and you're going to get promoted because it's about achievement. But to be original and to come up with new ideas that are original and thoughtful, you've, you, you got to get off that treadmill a little bit and have some right brain space and some practice on how do you really pay attention. So there's a great story about a guy that I met, um, a, guy, a guy called Martin Grivnow. He is, um, I think he leads the transformation effort across at uh, Genworth Financial across in the States. He's formerly of ING Bank in, mm. in Holland and IPSoft and those sort of places. He's gone through this a number of times. I remember meeting him at a conference and had him on the podcast and stuff because the story he told was brilliant. He's a, he's a Dutchman, so he is properly direct. Yeah. Right? He just <laughs> tell you how it is. Love but it. he has a system that he, and a pattern of how he works. And the first thing he does when he kind of takes on a new role and he lays this all out for his, kind of, for his future employers, he said, this is how I'm going to do things. If you don't like it, then... Yeah, you know, we're 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 done here, right? We're not, I'm not we're not. Let's not even start. So the first thing he says, I'm going to come and work for you before I start. I'm going to come and work for a month or two or whatever um, as an intern, because I want to see things how they are, right? And then it gives me a better understanding of what's going to be easy to change and kind of how things get done around here, right? So that's that's. First thing. And then when he actually arrives, he splits his kind of time three ways. The th a third of his time, he, um, he spends um, speaking to people that deal with customers on a daily basis or and or meeting kind of customers. So getting close to what's actually going to happen. The other third, another third of his time, he spends just wandering around the organization getting to know people and understanding how either what how the big picture kind of works so he goes local and then he goes if you like regional and then he spends the final third of his work doing what he says the proper work i.e <laughs> answering emails and doing kind of like you know meetings and all that type right. of stuff and writing reports and reporting and speaking to the board and all these different sort of things managing programs and now that might be quite extreme 
but I think it's a it, it's it's evidence of the level of commitment that it takes and the different sort of patterns that we have to try and adopt as leaders to drive the different results and to see things as they are not how we want them to see see them but see them how how we are so then we can have better understand where we are and we can more easily plot how we're going to get to where we want to be well what agile has done to a lot of organizations for senior leaders that haven't worked in it it's really disrupted them because for it to be done properly you let let the teams come up with the ideas you really give them the vision and the outcome and so you have to be more of a visionary leader to shape that and let the how it gets done happen amongst the teams and that's not the way most senior leaders have been trained in organizations to be there to remove barriers listen and then trust the people on the front lines closest to the problem who are really there listening and doing it to come up with the ideas and versus having the idea come from the top and you're just so many layers removed from reality Mm -hmm. that you'll never be able to to do that well in my opinion yeah, no, so I find it fascinating that, you know, and this is a, almost like a, it's indicative of, of how we've been educated and how we've kind of grown up. Uh, I'd be interested to hear about uh, what you're doing in uh, at the Sam Alton College. Yeah. Um, because I remember doing a bit of a, um, a brief kind of survey of all the major kind of MBAs around the world. Just wanted to better understand how many of them taught courses that would that we would call that would include soft skills as it were mm-hmm. like sales kind of leadership to an experiential level or 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 customer service right managing complaints and all that type of stuff dealing with people and, and I've been through an MBA, so my own experience is very little. But when I did this survey, I was horrified. <laughs> but the results that were like, most people don't teach this stuff. No. But this is really important stuff. But we teach analytics and we teach kind of like uh, rational kind of thought, reason and all these different things, you know, and financials and everything else. And but what's starting to show up now is that actually we're wanting and many leaders are kind of wanting because of the, not just because of who they are, they're deficient as people it's almost like how we've been trained well and yeah and so the most important or most sought after course class at the harvard business school is one that teaches from the book remains of the day okay of uh, the story of the butler and it's it's fiction right mm-hmm. it's a fictional story but what a powerful story and I had a chance to listen to, I forget the professor's name who teaches this course, but it's like the most sought out course to go to. And what he, what he basically said is that if you want to be successful in business, read more fiction, like forget the nonfiction, read fiction, because that's where the plot lines of life and the real truths of life have to work their way through. And you'll learn more from that. And so, you know, the Butler was Anthony Hopkins did a great job in the movie of, look, you know what? I've spent my whole life being dutiful, trying to do the right thing, and then all of a sudden, how do I square that if this guy, the owner, the boss, is um, a corrupt person? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I, what was was my life worth? Mm -hmm. And what they taught in the class is how to ask better questions and observe life and understand how people make decisions are based on human condition, Mm -hmm. more so than models and frameworks and concepts and to be a student of literature, student of fiction, is probably your best way to be prepared in the business world of the real world. That's a bit of what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, so I, um, another conversation I had recently, or a few months ago rather, was with um, a gentleman by, by the name of uh, Olaf uh, Schaubergsen, who is the chief experience officer, I believe, at, um, it was Ford, but now it's uh, Fjord, mm-hmm. rather, um, and is now Accenture Interactive. And they run programs to help, um, as you say, kind of some of these leaders actually kind of learn, unlearn or unlearn some stuff and then learn sort of new kind of behaviors and mindsets and things. And it's, it's, a, it's a full on sort of experiential uh, program where they, they combine some of their team with some of the, 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 the client's team and they kind of do it all together. Now, normally they would, they would go, 
they would have like a big day and they would be like, right, fine, let's go for a beer. Most of the executives turn around and go like, I just want to go home. <laughs> and sort of lie down. Because it's like, a, it's like melting my head. But it's absolutely transformative because they're a bit like, who knew? Yeah. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, when you stop and think about it, I do think the, with the pandemic, a lot of people are sitting home and having more time to reflect and think. And it's scary, probably for some who no, don't spend a lot of time on the right brain side, reflecting and thinking in that muscles and atrophy. That's it's a bit probably more scary uh, than not. And it's the mind blowing. You know, who knew I would be able to decompress and do this and then not have really good thinking to process. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, that's a scary place to be. I think it's, uh, but I also think, it, yeah, and I think it's right. But I think what's actually interesting, empirically, what we, what we've seen. Um, I think over the last kind of few months, so particularly throughout the, 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 the height of the pandemic, we've seen those leaders that have been um, openly vulnerable, that have been open to their own fallibility mm -hmm. and not needing to display the idea that, oh, I have all the answers. Follow me. It's all yeah. going to be fine. It's a case of like, when they say we're in this together, like going, we're in this together, right? Yeah. And we don't have all the answers, but we're going to work really hard and we're going to be straight right. with you and transparent with you with how things are kind of going on. And we've seen example and example of people around the world that have been uh, in leadership positions that have displayed these types of behaviors, these yeah. types of characteristics. And they're, whether they've got it right or not, and their, their performance might be... Um, you know, not that much different to many other kind of leaders. The level of trust that they have with their with their their, their population is just through the roof. Yeah, because people yeah. want to believe. Yeah, you you do. You know, it's interesting. I think that's also a good news story a bit for people that are really focused in the customer experience space because to do well in customer experience, you better get good at empathy and having empathy and being yeah. empathetic. And if you get good at that, it's what it's what the work does to you. All of a sudden, you become a more empathetic leader, which makes you more vulnerable, and transparent, and um, and more fit for the board as you go up. Because that's the kind of leadership it's going to take. Things aren't going to get less complex or less disruptive. No, no, and I, I, I absolutely um, right. I mean, and. I can't remember the, the exact numbers, but there was a piece of um, there was a piece of research that was done around about boards that highlights this this problem. I spoke to one of their partners, oh, it was over a year ago, about a piece of research that we were talking about exactly that sort of like boards are predominantly left brain, but there's a there's a massive kind of need for right brain thinkers, particularly yeah. as we've got this developing workforce, and particularly this the younger sort of the millennial, the Gen Z sort of workforce that are looking for this type of kind of leadership, and so that the the demand is absolutely there. Therefore, the imperative is, um, it, it, you know, is there. The problem is, is that we've got people that are in this kind of like one way of doing things, and and it's about being kind of right and being in control and things. And the thing is, a it's almost like assuming that it's a binary switch, and it's not. You just have to embrace it as a journey, right? Yeah. And it starts with, I might not have all of the answers, but I'd like to hear your opinion. Right. Yeah. You'll get much and, better ideas with that. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the problem is, is that people will kind of say, oh, we did that. I'm like, okay, and? And they're like, oh, well, we didn't get much back. And you're like, why did you not get much back? And they're like, well, people didn't tell us very much. And you're like going, why is that, do you think? And then you can dig in and dig in and dig in. Then you get to the heart of it, which is like, they don't trust you. Hmm. And then you have to think about, well, what can you do to build that trust? It was like, well, maybe you have to start by showing up hmm. and then keep showing up to show yeah. that you care, that you have to, can't just say that you care, you have to demonstrably show that. Yeah, that's a great... That, 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 that requires you to make the space. Yeah. For that connection, that. yeah, 
When you look at uh, a company in, in your consulting practice and they say, we need to improve our customer experience or whatever, um, how often do you first look at and say, well, how's the employee experience going? I mean, you almost could pull yourself into the HR consulting practice uh, because the question I have is how much does the employee experience or colleague experience, as you'd say in the UK, uh, translate and directly correlate to what customers are going to feel or see or believe? I mean, I think, it's, I think that they are ex, in, extrin, well, intrinsically linked. Um, and I don't think you can necessarily have one without the other. It doesn't, you know, logically doesn't follow that you'd have a great customer experience and a crappy <laughs> employee experience. I mean, like, that's magic if that happens, right? That's magic. Uh, um, and some people will focus on one thing or other. And I guess it all comes back to kind of what are the outcomes you're trying to drive? Um, but I also think that there's, I think you're absolutely right. People kind of like, you've got to set the conditions for, for both things to, to transpire. But I think what we also got to appreciate that experience is a, is a, is an evolving domain. So I use the, the idea of experience, like everybody's experience is this big set. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's different subdomains in that. So there's the customer experience, which is more of the external side of things. Then there's the employee experience, which is uh, the people that the experience of the people that are doing the work that are on your payroll, that are inside the tent, as it were. But then there's kind of the, the experience of all the people that support the delivery of your broad experience, whether it's the worker, uh, whether it's the, the yep. agencies, the contractors, the, yep. you know, the total the ecosystem. Actors. Pardon? Yeah, the total ecosystem. Yeah, the total ecosystem, which doesn't always get included in the employee experience, but should be. Yeah. Right. Um, I think there's a there's what I've been seeing. There's also this other emerging uh, domain, which is around the stakeholder experience, where it's that it which sort of includes the purpose thing. We've seen over the last few months that many people are looking to organizations to exercise their agency on their behalf, whether they are customers or employees or just the community at large to address some of the, the big questions that we're facing, whether they are social, political, uh, environmental, economic or whatever. And so they're, they're looking at organizations as agents of change. And I think that's, no, it's not, they don't have to do that, but they should, they should consider it. And then there's this one final thing that I think to, you know that, that that's right very central to kind of what what we're talking about here is and that's become more apparent of the last few months is the stresses and strains of our, of our operating models have have been put to the test and that is we need to look more much much more closely at the experience of the leader mm. at all levels of the organization whether they are at the kind of board level or all the way down to the person who's running kind of that frontline team um, because they are hugely important connective tissue in our organization. And they're often left out. I mean, usually it's a lot of frontline, maybe senior stuff. Leads me to my last question, which I'd love to get your point of view on, uh, and it's word agency. Hmm. Uh, and there is a lot of, in my belief, there's a lot of opportunity to lead change to, for good or for better, whether that's not just philanthropic, but to take out a new customer value proposition or, or do some stuff that's hard and difficult, but yet too many leaders wait to be given agency mm. or appointed agency from the top. And that seldom is how those ideas are born. A passionate leader will take agency mm -hmm. or they'll develop agency and they, and they know that agency includes the ability to influence multidisciplinary functions, not they all have to report to me. Uh, and if there's one thing I would love to see more is more leaders take that agency that's there. It's it's like the chalk that they could pick up and take, but they just mm -hmm. don't have the confidence, or there's fear, or there's some reason that they're not they're not picking that chalk up and go take it. Um, and 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 so what do you what do you believe to be true about that in terms of are there do do how many leaders need to be given permission, and how many great leaders that you see doing cool things have all been appointed that versus they've taken it. So I think the um, I think we need to the, the truth is is that everybody's an agent, and when they decide to do something, then that creates agency, mm -hmm. and that's the difference. 
you mm. know it's like we are and then it's when we decide to do something we create That's innovation right. whether we start with just with ourselves then we decide to do something different or that's important or that matters that creates agency that can grow from there right i think there's a great story of a guy by the name of um dan price who is the ceo of a company called gravity payments in seattle They're like a merchant a technology firm that do like merchant services type stuff and he was reading a paper about um oh i think it was from Daniel Kahneman and, and, and a fellow academic about at what point in, in an earnings scale do we start to achieve diminishing returns in terms of money as a contribution, contributor to happiness. And the, the number they got to was effectively about seventy dollars to $75,000 in US terms. So he said, he said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do we're going to set a minimum salary in our organization of $70,000. You know, so the, the lowest kind of like paid kind of like person would, everybody would just get elevated to that point And then people will have that thing. He said, because he said, here's the thing. I want to remove all the barriers that stop you bringing your bet, the best version of yourself to work. Hmm. Right now, he got slammed in many parts of the kind of the, the media as being like a communist disruptor, <laughs> kind of like a freak. He's going to bankrupt the company. La la la. And he got into like you know a lot of kind of like things. But then here's the thing: counterintuitively, perhaps that they were already doing well on their satisfaction sort of scores. Yeah. But actually, the number of leads coming into their business grew tenfold over the first kind of like month and kept going you know um the, the number of people that wanted to work for them just oh, kind of yeah. like went out the front door around the corner down the block and of just course. kept going right obviously <laughs> yeah. um and actually the amount of disruption it caused in, internally was actually relatively small hmm. but all the metrics went the right way and and, and if it goes back to that, you go back to the very kind of like first yeah. kind of like point you talked about this blue ocean. Yeah. Things. So it's not about necessarily what you create. Sometimes it's about what you do and what that creates. That's right. And well I think said. it's a beautiful story, which is in our current sort of like way of operating, our left brain way of operating, as it were, to do something which is hugely risk, uh, risky in, the, in our current paradigm but then offers um, fantastic results. There's another example, if I may quickly, that I'll tell you another example. Um, there's a guy that runs um, oh, a stand-up paddleboard company, and I forget his name, uh, down in, um, I think San Diego, called uh, uh, Tower Paddleboards. And he was concerned about employee well-being and how we get caught up in this idea that more hours is better and so he said, I want to make sure that we people that aren't spending extended hours in the, in the, in the office. And so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I want us to now work, um, only five hours a day. So I'm going to take out all the fat, what I think is fat in our working kind of day. And we're going to, we're going to come in at, um, we're going to come in at eight. We're not really going to have any breaks or any lunch breaks or anything. And we're just going to smash it through to one o'clock. Now, he was fully expecting um, that the business was going to take a hit in terms of top line kind of growth and things. But what actually happened is the opposite was true because he applied constraints to the way that people kind of worked. It forced them to think creatively about how they did their work and what they kind of delivered. And because it also forced them to communicate to their customers about what they were doing and why they were doing it. So the shop was open only five hours a day, the warehouse was only open five hours a day, the office was only open five hours a day, the website was open 24 seven, but there was only like, people were only around at the, at the, the five hours, so actually could do stuff. So the business kind of grew, customers kind of responded to it really well because they understood why they were doing it. 
and they thought that was great. Now, the, I think for me, the point is, is that you can do some of this stuff and it can feel counterintuitive, but it can drive some really, really creative and very, very innovative results. And you need those constraints. You need those constraints. I can tell you I had in marketing, it's not uncommon to have a much larger female uh, associate pool than a, than male. And the most productive, creative uh, workers for me almost always were single mom uh, parenting, single parent mom uh, working mothers because the their value of time and the perspective of time mm -hmm. was so important and precious that you you really were careful about how you spent it and made it work in the constraints of creativity because you didn't want to be you know working late at night sure. and everything else because the demands on them are so huge. Uh, as people, and so for others that had a, a low appreciation of the value of time, maybe because they had so much more time available, it um, they, they there was so much wasted, mm -hmm. and and so I think that idea of constraints. I love that idea of saying, okay, it's five hours a day. It's all we're going to work. You you think about that five hours so much more intentionally, sure, productively than you would if you said you had eight and then you don't think about it at all. Mm. That's brilliant. And if you don't, if it's eight, and that's the normal. But you go, well, I can stay for longer because yeah. I don't get it all done. But he's like going, no, it's eight. In at eight, out at one. I'm going to kick everybody out. Yeah, and, love that. And I think it's it's Stephen Arstel is his, is his name. Good. We'll look it up. We'll look it up. Well, Adrian, this has been fantastic and stimulating conversation. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? We didn't get to talk much about your book. Uh, what is the most provocative thing in your book that you think is the most provocative? Yeah, hold on. Um, I am going to say the most provocative thing in the book, forgive me, I'm just going to try and find it, um, is kind of this bit. Okay. And it says it, it's, it's got a back page and it's designed like a postcard. Yeah. And what it is, it's, a, it's like there's a, it's a letter mm. to CEOs um around you know sorting their team out and this is a letter to a ceo yeah so it's like from somebody that uh nobody you know that it's basically did it for a piece of fun it was based on a piece of research that came out of london business school and it said that um senior executives that they spoke to that said that nearly 60 percent reported regular conflict and infighting amongst the senior team mm. and and I just basically wrote this 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 uh, letter that says, well, if your people see this, then they think it's okay, right? And so the bit at the bottom is, please sort it out, and then it was invited people to sign it and then address it and send it to them. Now nobody's actually kind of like said that they've ripped it out and sent it to their CEO because they're probably going to get fired. <laughs> I love it. I know it. Yeah, it took me a while to get what you're talking about. Yeah, but you basically wrote a, a form letter that anybody could rip out and send yeah. that tells Sign the CEO it, to it. sort it out. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, and so it's there. The book is there to be, I always say it's like the idea of the being kind of punk is it's, it's an attitude and a mindset. It's not a method. Mm. That's up to you. And I'm trying to show people by being slightly provocative and being a bit more matter of fact about it that, you know what, this is important. This work matters to both customers and also to employees. And so if you care about it, then roll up your sleeves and jump in because yeah. people are waiting for you to show up. Oh, that's great. We only get one trip around this big blue marble. And so you might as well make it count and do something meaningful. So, well, thank you, Adrian, for everything you're doing to make the world a better place and encourage people to take on bigger challenges. Um, it's the right thing to be doing. I hope people do read your book or follow your podcast. Your podcast is great. Uh, thank you. And so it's, it's one of my uh, short list of podcasts to listen to because you've cover a lot of ground and, and you're not afraid to be a bit provocative. Um, you're going to love the next one that's coming up, by the way. I don't know when this is going to go out, but the, the um, look out for the one is um, that I'm going to be, it's going to be entitled, um, How Racist Is Your AI? Ooh. And that was the subject line of the email that got sent to me and I was like, what? 
Okay, you're definitely wading into it. Good for you. So it's a bit like, oh, that's a, oh, that's super cool. Um, and so yeah, I got a chance to speak to some people about that, which is yeah, and they've got a fascinating take on 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 some of that this sort of stuff. I mean, really, um, it, it just and I thought it was super interesting. Um, and, and, and important and it was a bit like when I saw that in the, in the email subject line where somebody kind of pitched the idea to me I'm like oh, I am, have, I'm all over that well that worked they're a very good email marketer well done yeah no, brilliant <laughs> it's brilliant well thanks again I really appreciate it thanks for listening to the Big Quest podcast with Andy Murray make sure to head over to bigquest.com to download our free checklist to launch your own Big Quest on the website, you'll find resources and ideas around the method, mindset, and motivation concepts behind the BigQuest framework. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe and leave a comment. We'd love to hear what resonated with you today. And if you want to share this podcast, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere you listen to audio. Our goal with this podcast is to help passionate leaders think differently and make meaningful change. Be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when the next episode goes live. Until next time, I'm Ben Ortlip here with Andy Murray, reminding you to think big and quest on. Uh